I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you, uh, either here or watching online this morning, uh, could raise your hand and say that this week has been the most exciting, joyful week of your life? In other words, you'd say, there's never been another week in my whole life where my joy was complete and overflowing. It's never been better. How many could do that? Yeah, that's what I wondered. And probably some of it has to do with whether you look at the glass as half full or half empty. And right now you're thinking about what happened this week. And, you know, I could do that as well. This week has been an interesting challenge in the building. If you notice, things have changed on the other side of the wall. And this week has been full of fire alarms, water pipes cut, Oops, yeah, oops, and dust, and lots of phone calls, and a grinding noise that sounds suspiciously like the same grinding noise in the dentist chair. And did I mention there was dust? And if I didn't mention it, let me just say it one more time, there was dust all over this place. Well, our daycare's beginning the preparation. And maybe, maybe some of us could say there has been great joy. I sat in a meeting of college, college students just a few days ago, and they were noting the fact that there seemed to be an unusual glow and smile on their face. And somebody said, it's finals over. And almost in unison, they all came grinning ear to ear and shaking their head. Yeah, finals are over. The exams are over. The school year is over. It was the end of the semester. Great, complete joy. I drove by the bar town bar and grill the other night. The parking lot was unusually packed that I haven't seen in about a year. I assume that they are celebrating what they believe to be that the end of a pandemic. A great celebration in progress. Have, have you ever noticed that the greatest celebrations, the most exuberant moments in our lives, usually come at the end of a difficult period? Moments when you would say, it can't get any better than this, happens at the end of a great trial or at the end of a period of suffering in our lives. Or some painful experience. Think about it in nature. Harvest never comes in the spring. It's always in the fall. At the end of the growing season. Graduation doesn't come at your freshman year, does it? I thought about that. I was thinking about that this week. I thought, what? Well, what would it be like if you could have the graduation first in anticipation of the next four years that you're going to put in and all the hard work that you're going to put into that and then you get your diploma and your degree at the beginning and then you work it out for four years? Probably not, especially when I just read that nationwide right now in most of our universities, the, the retention rate that gets students from the moment they go to college to the moment of graduation is only 64% of the students make it to graduation. Maybe, maybe you think about it in, the, in terms of the stimulus checks. And I just was talking to some employers the other day in one state where they're planning to give workers $1,200 if they'll get a job and stay with it for four weeks. And somebody said, well, what happens after the four weeks? And somebody said, well, they better pass another law because they'll get another job and get another $1,200 and you can just keep on going every four weeks. Quit and get another job and get another 12. I don't know how that works. You see, the world tries to manufacture joy. And they try to do it by beginning at the beginning of something rather than joy as something that comes at the end 
that begins something, the world cannot wait. It does not understand how to live long enough to wait for the sweetness of the joy that is available at the end of something. Jesus had something to say about that. And even as we think about it on today is Mother's Day. You're, you're thinking about your mother. Have you, um, have you ever wondered, have you, have you had a mother like mine who would say something like this? We saw the video of a lot of things that mothers say. You ever, did your mother, mother ever say something like this? Don't eat candy before the meals. Why did she say that? Because she knew it would spoil, is the way my mother put it. It would ruin your next meal that would be providing you the protein and the nutrients that you really need, that your body really needs, and you get in trouble eating candy because what you get from it is a sugar buzz and you don't feel hungry anymore. The candy masks the fact that your body needs the proteins and the vitamins. But that's what the world offers, isn't it? It offers us the candy and the sugar. Things like power and money and success and sex. And perhaps the most addictive sugar, spiritual sugar, is this idea that we can live constantly in favorable circumstances. And we tie the joy to the favorable circumstances. I've heard Christians say in their spiritual life, I believe in God. And I believe that I'm going to heaven and I've trusted him. And I've trusted in his atonement on the cross. But they're basing their joy on the favorable circumstances that they're living in. And when the circumstances change, it either drives us away from God or it drives us to God. And that which begins to fulfill us at the hungry spiritual level of our lives. When Jesus went to speak about this in John chapter 15 that we'll look at in a moment. It is interesting and fascinating to me that in the context of John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking at a moment in which the future is pretty dark. In fact, he is speaking about joy at the beginning of a period that is about to enter into great suffering and great heartache and death and persecution. He is personally on his way to the cross. The Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles in the Old Testament, which was known as the Feast of Joy, was 60 days away at this moment when Jesus is talking. The dark clouds are beginning to gather on the horizon at that moment. In the citadels of the government, they are plotting and scheming and legislating to try to find some way to control the people and to keep riots from erupting in the streets all over the Roman Empire. The religious leaders are gathered in the temples and the synagogues trying to figure out how they're going to deal with this new threat of this wannabe Messiah that everybody's flocking to by the name of Jesus. And they're, and they're, they're wondering how they're going to deal with that. And, and even the audacity that some are even saying that this man is the Son of God himself. Nothing Nothing for these disciples is normal. In fact, you might say they are headed for a new normal and nothing would be the same again. The world is literally being turned upside down. In fact, so much so that Luke would later record in the book of Acts, that's exactly what happened. The world is turned upside down. It's not normal anymore. It's gone crazy. And yet Jesus gathers his appointed 12 apostles around him. And he's just told them, I'm going to leave. I'm going back to the Father. But I'm not going to leave you as orphans with no guidance in your life. 
He said, I'm going back to the Father that I can prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And he's just encouraged them that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. But it's all future. There is no sign of any kind of visible, present joy. And yet, here's what he says. Listen to him. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Notice in verse 11, of John chapter 15 that at the end of this whole passage Jesus says I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy some translations say complete joy some say perfect joy your joy will be complete and the words that Jesus speaks here when he says to them, I've told you these things, he's saying there, I, I'm, I have told you in the past, I'm telling you in the present, and I will tell you, and I'm going to keep reminding you because you need the reminders of this. I've told you these things in order that your joy, and I'm going to have to keep telling you that these things are true, in order that your joy will be complete. And when he speaks to them of this promise of joy, he's not talking about something fleeting or ongoing. He says there come, can come a moment in your life in which I will fill you completely with my complete joy. But it's interesting in the language that it's very clear in the Greek that it's a possibility and a potential, but it's not automatic. You don't just fall into this joy. You don't just grow into this joy. It's a potential. It's a possibility. But it has to come about in certain ways because there are conditions before this joy can be complete in our lives. 
And one of the ways that Jesus talks about this is that this joy does not come at the beginning, but it comes at the end. Jonathan Kahn, the Messianic Jewish pastor who and author has made this clear that Jesus has in mind as he's talking here the Feast of Tabernacles, which was celebrated by the Jews every year at harvest time. It was the, called the Feast of Joy, and in this Feast of Joy, they celebrated the harvest, the provision, the produce, the promised land. But it always came at the end of the year, in the autumn. It was, it was after all had come in the hot and the heat of the summertime. It was, it was at the end. You see, the world, the way it shapes the world is that we are born and then we do what? We get older and older and older and older. But what Jesus is saying here in the spirit, we get younger and younger and younger and younger in our lives. It's exactly the opposite in the world. And it is through the way that seems hard. It's through the way of sacrifice. It's, it's through the way of self-control. It's through the way of righteousness that all of this leads and runs headlong into the complete joy that Jesus was talking about. He saves the best for last. It is the omega, the, the ending joy that Jesus speaks about. The Apostle Paul echoed that in 2 Corinthians 4 when he wrote, This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles, as one translation says, are like small potatoes. <laughs> They're small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things which we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. One of my pastor colleagues had an untimely death due to cancer, died a few weeks ago. I was talking to his district superintendent who went to visit him a week and a half before he, he went to heaven. And as he was sitting and talking with this dear brother about, about the journey he was on, he, he just said to his district superintendent, you know what, I have a week and a half left. And he said, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go, but I have a week and a half left. And the district superintendent tried to comfort him in some way and say, I don't even understand what to say to you at this moment in life. But I've heard, I've heard, I've had other people tell me that when they come to the moment of, of dying, the moment of dying, there is a special grace that God gives to you in that moment. And I'm praying that he will give you that special grace. And the pastor friend simply looked at his district superintendent and he said, oh, Oh, brother, he said, God's already given that to me. I'll see you on the other side. That's the kind of joy that Jesus was talking. How did we get there? Well, Jesus tells us, and it's interesting. I don't know whether Jesus went to seminary or anything, but in this passage, he gives us a three-point sermon. <laughs> It's right there. The first thing that I want us to note is right there in verse 1. And it is a decision that you will have to make if you're going to ever experience the complete joy and the possibility and the potential of experiencing the complete joy that Jesus talked about. It is the decision deciding your ultimate allegiance. What is your ultimate allegiance? Uh, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Notice he didn't say, I'm like a vine. N Notice that Jesus doesn't say, I'm one of many vines, and I'm the best one of all the vines. No, he says, I am the vine. But not only that, he says, I am the true vine. What in the world does that mean? How can a vine be true as you watch the tractor go? What's a true vine? 
What makes a vine true? Is there a false vine? If you went out to any winery around the southern Iowa hills, would you find somebody where someone would say, well, that's a true vine, and that's a false vine, and that's a true vine, and that's a false vine? What, what, did, what did Jesus mean by this? What, what's, what's untrue if Jesus is the true vine? Well, it's important that we understand that Jesus was pointing to what every listener in this context would have understood out of the imagery of the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, you will find the word, the the, the imagery of a vine used all over the Old Testament. It always was the metaphor used to describe the nation of God's people, Israel. Israel was the vine. And in fact, so much was this a prominent reality in their lives that they had this huge golden plated vine, 90 feet high, that would sit in their temple, that would symbolize the prosperity of God's blessing and their chosenness as the people of God, as the nation and the people of God. The vine was a favorite metaphor to describe the people of Israel. For instance, in in Psalm 80, here's what the psalmist wrote. You brought a vine out of Egypt, Israel. You drove out the nations. You planted it. You cleared the ground for it. You took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. And it sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Here is the people of God being described as a massive vine that the Lord has planted for the purpose of redemption. But if you're familiar with the Old Testament, it is interesting to note what happens to this vine, Israel. Jeremiah laments in chapter 2, God's words when he said, I planted you a choice vine entirely of pure seed. How then, says the Lord, Have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? By and large, throughout the Old Testament, though we have the bright spots where the people of God shone in the purpose that God had given to them to be the the authors of the redemption that would go out to the whole world, we see the bright spots. But by and large, this vine of Israel proved to be false. It couldn't pull off the redemptive task that they had been called to because their national symbol of the vine became their allegiance rather than the God who chose them. And it was the kind of spirit that led the disciples, you remember, to ask Jesus right before Pentecost, is this where we get back to normal? Is this where we get the power back? Is this where you're going to give the power back to the nation of Israel and everything gets back and you're going to take the oppressors and set us free from all the oppression around us? And you remember Jesus' response? He said, it's not for you to know the times and the chronology and the calendar that the Father has put in the seasons about how all that works out. But this I do know you will receive power from the Holy Spirit after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and this I do know I don't know about all the timing and the frame time frame and the calendaring of it but you will receive power to become my witnesses to the whole world and to all the nations and so when Jesus says here in John I am the true vine it was scandalous it was unexpected He's saying that the faithful and, the, and Israel was not the faithful and true vine. They had failed, but he would succeed. He was saying that God's righteousness requirements were not fulfilled in the nation of Israel, but they would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Jesus begins to say to them, the joy that I give will not come in allegiance to anything else than to Jesus himself. Now you might be wondering, wait a minute, if Jesus said that this is this true and there is a philosophy and a theology going around these days in the life of the church that says that the church, God raised up the church as the true Israel and that he's totally done with Israel. They call it replacement theology. That God is totally done with the nation of Israel. 
Don't, don't be mistaken by that. Paul talked about the fact that, that Israel is still, that there is a sense in which it still has its divine imagery and that we've been grafted in and that eventually God will have his remnant. They must all become a part of the church. They must all come through the blood of Christ. They're not going to get any special favors in terms of salvation. But God tells us in his word that he's not forgotten the fact that they are his people. But here's the key. It is not the nation. It is not anything else in allegiance that will lead us to the joy that only Jesus can bring. And he announces this new and faithful planting of the Lord. He represents God's pleasure. Joy comes in and through him. He does not come through your politics. He does not come through the empire the joy that Jesus gives is not going to come from tax cuts. It's not going to come from raising taxes to supply all of your needs free. Joy doesn't come through a flag. It doesn't come through the image of a 90-foot vine in the temple. It doesn't come through a flag, but neither does it come through kneeling in protest. Joy that Jesus gives doesn't come by making everybody exactly equal in terms of what they have. It doesn't come through equity. The joy that Jesus gives does not come through a courtroom. It doesn't come from human exacting of justice and revenge. It doesn't come from any other source but through Jesus. And any other source will ultimately not pr produce lasting good fruit. The allegiance is always in the world a symbol of judgment. It will not produce the good fruit. But Jesus said... I will produce good fruit in you. Well, how does he do that? He tells us there's a pruning process that takes place. Now, in ancient times, there was two types of pruning. There was the pruning that Jesus talked, that John talks about here, that was literally, as you saw in the, in the video, the cutting away of all the branches that don't produce fruit. But there was also a pruning in which you would go along, as we saw in the video, and you would simply clip the little vines that are growing out of the main branches, but are taking all the nutrients from the branches that are actually producing the grapes. And he removes the unproductive branches and he cleanses the productive branches so they can bear more fruit. And Jesus said, if there's going to be the potential and the possibility of experiencing my complete joy, then there is this pruning, that cutting away that has to take place in your life. Well, what does that cutting away look like? Sometimes it's the cutting away from the very things that we think will bring us the joy and will make life make sense to us. There are some things that are pretty obvious. Paul wrote about this very thing in Galatians chapter 5. He said, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are clear. Here's what Jesus wants to cut away in your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, setting anything in your life, even good things above him, sorcery, which the Greek word there includes the use of drugs and illicit drugs and paraphernalia of drugs to, to, to create an alternate mood. It's all wrapped up in that word. Hostility. He wants to cut that away. He wants to cut away the quarreling and the jealousy, the, the uncontrollable outbursts of anger that you experience. He wants to take away the selfish ambition, the dissension. And oh, how much we need this in our day. The, the spirit of division. He cuts that away. He cuts away envy. Oh, I wish I could, wish I could have that guy's truck. I really like that truck. I really like that, that house. I, I wish we could get that house. I, I, the, the, the constant moving in the envy and drunkenness. Wild parties and other sins like these. 
And then Paul says, let me tell you again as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. They can't experience the joy that Jesus is talking about. You see, joy comes from the pruning of those things. But it's not only the cutting away, but now he comes to even take away what looks good in our life, but which is not producing the fruit. I walked in this morning and I looked over at the counter and somebody brought homemade brownies. You got some of them. I wanted one really bad. And a voice said to me, don't you dare. That'll get in your throat. And you got to preach. And that won't sound too good. I have a little slight allergy to that. Now you can say whether that's the spirit or not. But he wouldn't let me have a brownie this morning. I may get one later. And suffer all afternoon. But that's, that's suffering I can handle. You see, it's the things in your life. It may be the brownies that, that, that seemingly have no, no, there's nothing wrong with them. But it doesn't produce the fruit in you. The way you use your time. The way you use your talents. What is it that has the ultimate allegiance in your life? And what is it that, that the Holy Spirit needs to cut away and prune in order that you can experience the fullness of his joy. Jesus said, not only is it the allegiance you have to decide, but you have to decide if you want this joy that Jesus has, if you want to experience the full joy, you have to decide your level of connectedness to the vine. Remain in me, verse 4, he said. The word abide. It speaks to connectedness, but it's, it's more than just staying there. It's, it's more than hanging out. Can you imagine if someone who ever purchased these? Can you imagine if somebody brought in this plant without the vase in the soil and said, here, hope you enjoy it. Well, it's hanging out. It is a plant. It looks alive for the moment. But apart from the soil being planted, it would not live. Jesus is saying there's a lot of Christians. There's a lot of folks, religious folks, who hang out around the church. There's a lot of folks who believe in Jesus. There's a lot of folks who profess to be a Christian, but they're just kind of hanging out. They've never been rooted and grounded to remain and abide in Jesus. And Jesus says there has to be something beyond the beginning of the relationship. There has to be a rootedness. There has to be a connectedness that goes deeper than just hanging out with Jesus. And the promise is, is that when, when we are rooted in Him, then we produce much fruit. Some have tried to interpret this, that this means that, 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 that if you really have the, the, the connectedness with Jesus, that, that you'll be able to go out and be a witness and hundreds of people will get saved every month or every year. Jesus isn't talking about converts here, but it's interesting that he is talking about the environment that begins to attract those who need Jesus in their lives so that you will experience that that that, that will flow out and, and if you've never experienced out of your life any kind of influence that has brought someone to Christ there is a complete joy that you have not yet experienced in your life that Jesus wants you to have and it doesn't begin by going out and trying to make converts of people it begins by becoming rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus and let the Holy Spirit begin to overflow out of that relationship that which brings the kind of fruit that then draws people to your life because it's like Jesus. Paul wrote about that in Galatians. He said, in fact, the fruit of the Spirit. The kind of fruit that the Spirit produces in chapter 5, he said, is this, love. Oh, there it is, joy. He produces a peace, a sense of well-being. A sense that God is at work. Kindness. Goodness. The, the, the kind of 
of, of patience. You say, well, I, I know all about patience. And we often hear that you don't want to pray for patience because God will give you more trials. He's not talking about that kind of thing here. Jesus is, Paul is talking here about a patience that is able to wait because we see the big picture by faith that leads to the faithfulness that keeps us rooted and grounded so that we can long term experience the joy that only Jesus brings. It brings us to gentleness. Well, what in the world is that? I'm always amazed when I see some movie or something with the circus. And you remember the old circuses that used to tour the country. And, 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 and they always had the show with the elephants. And it's always amazed me that they take this massive creature that in the wild you do not want to meet a mad elephant. But they take this massive powerful creature and they put a stake in the ground and a little chain around one foot. And he stays there. Massive power, and yet the appearance of meekness and gentleness. That's the picture here. It is the ability in the spirit, the kind of fruit that has massive power, but knows when to use it and when not to use it. It is this discernment of self Control. That's the next one. We have this ability to control a desires. Against such there is no law. And Jesus said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. What kind of fruit? Well, joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And, and when that begins to overflow out of your life, it will be attractive to other people. But then there's this last one. The decision that you have to make. If you're going to experience the complete joy of Jesus, you have to decide that you want to become stable. In verse 9 and 10, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Earlier he said, remain in me, but now he talks about remaining in love. Well, how do you do that, Jesus? Verse 10, when you listen to and follow my instructions, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I listen to the instructions of my Father's commandments and I remain in His love. Jesus is reminding us that this is not about your feelings. This is not even about a philosophy. This love that Jesus talks about doesn't have anything to do with your sexual orientation. This, this love that Jesus talks about is that which defines God and God defines that love. It has a love that desires the best interest for the other. It operates in instructions and knowledge and unity. It's the kind of love that Jesus says in this passage that moves us from the mentality of being slaves or servants to the role of being sons and daughters and friends. You say, what's the difference between a slave and a servant and a friend or a son or a daughter? Jesus said, well, the big difference is, is that, is that the 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 slave or the servant doesn't know all of the master's business. And Jesus said, I no longer think of you as slaves and servants. Now, some of us are still there. We think of ourselves as slaves and servants. We serve Jesus because we don't want to go to hell. We serve Jesus because we're supposed to. We serve Jesus because that's what I learned in Sunday school. I serve Jesus because that's what mom and dad did. I serve Jesus because, well, I don't want to look bad in front of all the other folks. I serve Jesus for a dozen different motives. Jesus is saying, I no longer look at you like that. And I'm inviting you into another kind of relationship. That which is a son or a daughter or a friend. Because I'm not keeping any secrets from you. I'm letting you in on all that I'm doing. I want you to know everything that I'm about. I want you to see everything that I'm doing. I want you to be a part of everything that I'm doing in your life and in the world. He shares the knowledge. And then I love this passage. Jesus said because of that, 
because you get to know everything that I'm doing. You can ask anything in my name, and you'll get it. Oh, that sounds like a blank check, doesn't it? No, no, notice, in my name. Some years ago, I was called by one of the general leaders of the church and said to me, Lee Ray, um, I was planning to attend a conference in your area that I think is pertinent to the global church and especially to certain segments of the global church. And I'm not going to be able to make it to Des Moines to sit in on that conference. He said, it's already paid for. They probably already got my name tag. And he said, uh, I can't come, but you're there close by. Could you attend that conference for a couple of two or three days in my name? I was a young pastor. That sounded like a pretty good deal. And I literally went to this conference and they gave me the badge with his name. That's kind of cool. What's your name? Lee Ray? And the badge said, Raymond. Raymond. And I thought, wow, this is feeling pretty good. And then he said to me, he said, and, and wherever you have that badge, wherever you go, you get all your meals if you have that name. You'll get everything that you need. They'll give you all of the resources. You won't have to pay for anything as long as you have my name. And I went to the conference, and for two or three days, it was cool to be somebody else and get all of the perks and all of the free meals and everything else in somebody else's name, but only in his name. I thought about going to buy the new Cadillac, but I knew that I probably couldn't. Jesus says, you can ask anything in my name because I've showed you all that I'm doing. What are you asking for these days? <laughs> In his name. James put it this way. He said, you can ask, but you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person won't, it can't expect anything from the Lord. So such a person becomes, and here's what James called it, double-minded and unstable in everything they do. Do you know people like that? You don't know where they're going to land. You don't know what they're going to do next. You, they're totally unpredictable. You, you, you don't know what's going to happen to them. And maybe this morning you see that in your own life. There is this double-mindedness. You want to serve God with one part of your heart. But there's this other part of your heart that wants to do your own thing. Go your own way. And, and do your, your thing. And so you never know what you're asking for. And you ask for things and you come to the Father and you ask, but you don't know if you're going to get it because you don't know if that's really in His will or not. You see, Jesus says when you begin to know the big picture about what Jesus is doing in your life, you can come with confidence and say, Lord, I believe this fits in what you've told me about what I need to be doing and where I need to go. I grew up in a home in which my dad did that with every car we ever bought. I'll never forget it. He'd go and the dealer would say, well, it, it's going to cost this much. And dad would say, that's a dime too much. And the guy, a dime, just a dime. And God said, no, that's not what I'm supposed to pay for that car. Where'd he get that? And we'd come home and we'd hear family altar. And dad would say, you know, father, we need a car for ministry. And we need it for this and that and the other. And you know which one's going to be mechanically sound. You know what's in that car. You know what's the one we drove today. You know what's going to happen to that. We, would you guide us that we will not get a lemon? And I never saw my dad in, in all the years that I was home get a lemon car. But we test drove several. <laughs> and I remember the one that we had electric windows and it was a fancy gold Fury 3 something Plymouth. And man, us kids, we thought it was the greatest car ever. Gold and electric windows and, and power air conditioning. We'd been in a Volkswagen bug. We thought we were, we'd died and gone to heaven. We're getting, a, we're getting this kind of car. 
And well, Dad, this is the one. This is the one. This is the one. But he heard something in the engine, something. And he stopped and tinkered around a little bit. Dad, can't we, can't, are we going to get this one? And I remember being so disappointed that we weren't going to get the gold car with the power windows. And took it back to the shop. And later learned that there was some major problem with the car. You see, when we, when we, when we, Seek to know. We're not unstable. And notice what Jesus said. I promise. That, that, that if you'll live and remain in me and in my love. You'll be reminded of the fact. I didn't, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And he says when I choose you. I've appointed you. What's he saying? I love this word here. It literally means that Jesus has a place specifically for you to flourish and to grow in your ministry and in your life. He has a place for you. He has appointed a place for you to be the best productive fruit bearing part of the vine, the branch. A place that I would like to call a place that you belong. Some of you, you're longing to belong, but the fact is, you, 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 you've never felt like you belonged. You've not found the place that has been appointed to you. There's a place at greater life for you in ministry. Do you know that? I believe God has a place for every one of us. If you have found that place, ask Him about it. Let's talk about it. Let's pray together about that. But He has a place that He has appointed you where you will produce the best, most productive fruit that will lead you to incredible, complete joy in Christ. When it begins to happen, it changes everything. Scripture says that the path of the righteous is like the morning sun. It shines brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. Maybe you've heard the verse that Nehemiah wrote when the people gathered for celebration and heard the word of the Lord and began to cry and weep because they realized how far short of God's law they had been living. And Nehemiah got up and said, quit your weeping and crying. This is a sacred day. This is, this is a wonderful day. Don't be dejected and sad. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. It led the songwriter to write, hold on my child. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping only lasts for the night. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. The darkest night means dawn is just in sight. It was, it was the Hebrew writer who said of Jesus that Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. The champion initiates and perfects our faith because the joy that awaited him. Notice, notice the order there. The joy that was yet to come awaited him, and so he endured the cross. He didn't count and dwell on all of the shame, but he seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. And the same joy that Jesus experienced, God wants to give to you and put you in the right and proper place. You can live a life of joy. Ken Fusen actually wrote his own obituary before he passed here in Des Moines. It was published in the Des Moines Register last year. Let me read what he wrote. Ken Fusen, born June 23, 1956, died January 3, 2020 at the Nebraska Medical Center of liver cirrhosis and is stunned to learn that the world is somehow able to go on without him. Ken attended the University of Missouri Columbia's famous school of journalism which is a clever way of saying I almost graduated but didn't facing a choice between covering a story for the newspaper or taking his final exams Ken went for the story he never claimed to be smart just committed in 1981 Ken landed his dream job working as a reporter for the Des Moines Register Ken won several national feature writing awards no, he didn't win a Pulitzer Prize, but he's dead now, so get off his back. 
In 2011, Ken accepted a job in the marketing department at Simpson College, where he remained until 2018. He was diagnosed with liver disease at the beginning of 2019, which is pretty ironic given how little he drank. He is survived by his sons who all brought Ken unsurpassed joy. He hopes they will forgive him for not making the point more often. He loved his boys and was and is extraordinarily proud to be their father. Ken had many character flaws, but he still owes, and if he still owes you money, he's sorry, sincerely. He prided himself in letting other drivers cut in line. For most of his life, Ken suffered from a compulsive gambling addiction that nearly destroyed him, but his church friends never gave up on him, and he placed his last bet on September 5th, 2009, he died clean. He hopes that anyone who needs help will seek it. Miracles abound. Ken's pastor says God can work miracles for you and through you. Skepticism may be cool, and for too many years, Ken embraced it. But it was the faith in Jesus Christ that forever transformed his life. That was the one thing he never regretted. It literally changed everything. God is good. Embrace every moment, even the bad ones. See you in heaven. And Ken promise, promises to let you cut in line. <laughs> you think he found complete joy? Yeah. And it started because he settled his allegiance. What are you depending on? Where are you looking for the joy? He, he settled his connectedness issue. He became rooted and grounded in Christ. He allowed the Holy Spirit to cut and prune some things out of his life. The addictions. Then he allowed God the Holy Spirit to fill him with love that you can catch. You can feel it in that obituary. It just spilled out into the lives of others. Would you bow your heads with me this morning?